Hello, and welcome to part two in our series on how science proves intelligent design. We're in the process of looking at the human body, some of the uh, organs and uh, the basic things that are in the human body. We left off uh, in the last lesson looking at arteries and veins and the different valves that are inside the, the veins, uh, showing that uh, clearly there is intelligent design. Let's continue on in our study here with number six, and that's the digestive system. The next two or three I'm going to hit kind of lightly, but again, look at the intricacy here. Look at look at the design, how things work together. The digestive system is made up of the gastrointestinal tract, which is called the GI tract. It consists of the mouth, the esophagus, the stomach, the small intestines, the large intestines, the rectum, the liver, the pancreas, and the gallbladder. All these nine elements designed for specific functions and designed to work in unison in order to keep us alive. Again, random chance, intelligent design. We all know that digestive, di digestion is critical to us staying alive. Uh, it is the idea, it's the whole process of where we take in food uh, and the food is broken down into smaller molecules and to nutrients so that it can be absorbed in the blood and then through the circulatory system dispersed throughout the body so that every single part of the body and every single cell in the body gets the oxygen and gets the nutrients uh, that is needed in order for it to begin to function. We know that the food is broken down into proteins, into fats, into carbohydrates, into vitamins, and into different minerals. All of these components working together again to make our bodies what it is. When we start to get an imbalance of these things, then our body does not function properly. You know, a lot of times the, the dietitians will tell us you need to get more minerals, you need to get more vitamins, uh, you have the wrong kinds of fats, too many carbohydrates, uh, we need more protein. All of these things are intricate to us functioning and look at how through the digestive system that our body is made in order to get these nutrients, all these uh, required minerals and vitamins and nutrients from the food that we eat. Not only does our body work as, as a finely tuned machine in order to extract that, the things that we eat have those things in them. They all work together in unison to keep us alive and make us function properly. Next that we want to look at quickly is the immune system. The immune system defends the body against bacteria, viruses, and other pathogens that may be harmful to the body. Our body makes proteins that are called antibodies and they destroy, work at destroying any abnormal or foreign cells that try to get into the body. They help to fight off common ailments like uh, the flu or cold and protect us from illnesses. Uh, there is also in the immune system a backup system which is called the cell mediated immune system. This involves immune system cells rather than antibodies. Again, don't worry about all the definitions. There's not going to be a test. Don't let your eyes glaze over, but focus on the intricacy and the importance and how these things function. Again, that's what we're going here. Now, this, this backup cell mediated immune system, what that actually does is it helps your body create memories. Helps your body, helps the cells create mem memories of past defenses against certain threats. What does all that boil down to? That's how a vaccine works. When you get a vaccination or you get an immunization, what they do is they give you whatever you're being vaccinated for, whether it's like for measles or chicken pox or the flu, uh, whatever it might be, they're giving you a small amount of that bacteria. 
Uh, if it's for the flu, it's a small amount of a certain type or certain types of flu or the measles. They give you a small amount where your body can handle it. So that's injected into your body. Your body makes the antibodies which are able to fight against that small amount. But now with this backup system, your body now remembers that. So if in the future you get hit with the real thing, then your body is able, the cells are able to go back here, remember the antibodies that were brought up before that, and go out and then fight the real thing so that you don't get the real thing. I mean, it's absolutely fantastic. Who in the world figured this out? When I say who in the world, I mean what human being on their own figured this out to make this happen? And even if they could, uh, I'm, I'm going to say this throughout the whole series, even if you could figure it out, how did you make it happen? I mean, how did you make it happen? I always go to simple thing and we're not even going to deal with it. It's like we have teeth. Well, how did we get teeth? How did we make our bodies grow teeth? And how do we tell our bodies, let's have two sets of teeth. When we're small and tiny, we'll have a baby set of teeth, and then that baby set of teeth, they'll kind of, they'll fall out, and then there's a bigger set of teeth up there for when our mouth is fully developed, and we'll have a bigger set of teeth so that we can chew our food and be able to digest our food. How, how did we know to do that? And not only how did we know to do it, how did we make the body do it? How did it come about? And if we were able to do that and knew how to do it, well, why didn't we make three sets of teeth? Why didn't we make it so like if you lose a tooth after you get your regular tooth, your adult teeth, well, you just grow another one. Well, that's crazy, Tarsitana. You can't do that. Sharks do it. Sharks lose the teeth all the time from the way they eat. And they just grow another one. That's all. The octopus does it when it loses one of its tentacles, grows another one. Why don't we just grow another arm when we lose? Yeah, you follow what I'm saying? If we can tell the thing to do it once, let's tell it to do it twice. And if you can't tell it, how do you tell it? How did, how did we make these things come about? How did these things come into being without something telling it to happen? That's the whole point. That's the whole point. That's not the whole point. It's a big point of intelligent design. Not only how to design it, but how to actually make it happen. We're going to conclude with what, how those things were designed and how it actually happens. Let me get back to where we were. Immune system, number eight, the muscular system. We kind of already touched on that a little bit when we were looking at the skeleton, but you have uh, two types of muscles. Well, there's different types of muscles, but two primary functions. You have voluntary, which is like we want our muscles to do something. We want to walk. We want to talk. We want to uh, you know move our arms. We say we want to reach out and grab something. We think, go out here and grab it. Hardly without even thinking, sometimes we just automatically do it. And then we have the involuntary muscles. Heartbeat. The heart is a muscle. We don't, thankfully, have to tell our heart to beat. We wouldn't be able to go sleep at night. Because when we stop thinking and, and went to sleep, our heart would stop beating. Or breathing. We don't have to tell ourselves to breathe. We just involuntarily do that. So there's muscles that function in two different capacities. We have approximately 640 muscles in the body, and they're broken into two uh, sets, identical sets, 320 and 320 on each side that do things. They help stabilize our joints when we're looking at skeletons, help us maintain our posture, be able to stand up. They generate heat during activities. They protect our organs. Um, they aid in digestion and they ensure the flow of blood. Again, this is, th th this is an avenue that if you're looking to do a deeper study, I mean, to get in to look at all the different muscles in the body and how they work and how they function, how they make things, how everything, you know, pulls. And there's a muscle, if I put my arm down, well, there's no muscle pushing it down. Every muscle pulls. So there's a muscle pulling it down. I want to lift my arm up. There's a muscle that pulls it up. I want to move my fingers down. There's a muscle that pulls it down. Muscles to pull it up. Muscles to make it wiggle. Muscles, to, I mean... It's all. A, it's a phenomenal study. I'm just hardly even sk skimming the surface here. But once again, all the different muscles in there and what they do and how they work together and how they're so coordinated in the body and how they work on a voluntary basis and on an involuntary basis. Random chance. Intelligent design. You decide. Number nine, and I want to spend a bit more time here. 
the reproductive system. The reproductive system in a human being and a lot of animals, but we're focused on the human being. This is absolutely fantastic. And I'm scratching the surface with this. I'm just kind of spelling out how certain procedures take place in order to produce a human. Uh, again, it's mind-boggling. I'm going to go through it, broken it down into a couple of different groups. A lot of technical terms here. Again, don't let your eyes glaze over. Uh, there's not, again, there's not going to be a test. You don't have to be able to spell all of this out. But just look at it, and as we spell out the different things and look at what happens, how it happens, and why it happens, continue to ask the question. Random chance? Evolution? intelligent design a designer someone who thought this through so here here's what you need the essential <clears throat> the essential organs that are required the essential organs and cells that are required both male and female you have I'm going to give you seven here you have one you have the ovary which has the female egg you have the sperm from male for fertilization, testicles which produces the sperm, fallopian tubes which carries the egg down to the uterus, which we're going to break this down, the, the uterus itself uh, where gestation takes place. You have on the female the vagina, which is the in, point of insertion to receive a male sperm. And on the male you have the penis, which is the organ that injects the sperm into the vagina. Now let's break this all down. The basic process here, and again, note the complexity and the organization. In the beginning, the first, you have ovulation. Ovulation is, again, the ovaries are the primary female reproductive organ. They have three important functions, the ovaries. They secrete hormones. They protect the eggs a female is born with. And thirdly, they release eggs for potential fertilization. Okay, approximately once a month, here's the process, a woman's ovaries release an egg that travels down the fallopian tubes. This is why there's certain times that a woman can become pregnant and there's certain times that she can't. So you have approximately once a month, the woman's ovaries release an egg that travel down the fallopian tubes. At the same time, the muscles around and in the cervix become more elastic. I'm sorry, the mucus, the mucus that is in there become more elastic. This allows the sperm to travel more easily. So the whole body is getting ready now. Let's release an egg. Let's get ready to receive the sperm so that fertilization can take place. So the egg now travels down the fallopian tube where this is where it can become fertilized. Naturally, there, there, there has to be the sperm to fertilize it. Uh, if it's not there, then it doesn't get fertilized. So next step is fertilization. Sexual intercourse takes place. Male penis is inserted into the female vagina. This, uh, we, we all know how this takes place, but the reason that I bring this up is because I believe that this in itself is monumental evidence of design. The female organ is designed to receive the male organ. The male organ is designed to be inserted into the female organ. I mean, they don't both look the same. They're not, and they're compatible. Uh, and I, you have to use the word design. We have numerous things in our physical world that exemplify the same thing. Uh, you have nuts and bolts. You, you have the, the male end and then you have the female. The nut goes over. One is designed to be inserted into the other. Uh, you have the couplings on a hose uh, where the one has the thread and that's designed to go in to the part that has the threads on the inside. So you put them together and that's how you connect a hose to a water source or you connect the hoses together. They're actually called the male and female ends, the male and female couplings. Uh, a plug in the wall. Same principle. You have the two prongs that go into two slots that are in the wall. I mean, there's so many things when you're looking to connect that, that man has designed them on the same principle of how a human body is designed. 
to me that said that just there you see intelligent design but let's keep going on so number one uh, we're in fertilization sexual intercourse takes place <clears throat> the male reaches a climax and ejacu ejaculates sperm into the vagina millions of sperm now travel into the woman's vagina and up the birth canal if the egg has been released see both of these have to take place if the egg is released and you have no sperm no fertilization if the egg is released and the, I'm sorry and if there's sperm and no egg then you don't have any fertilization they both have to take place so if an egg has been released from the ovaries and is accessible by the sperm then only then can one sperm enter and fertilize the egg listen to this because this is phenomenal the egg is surrounded by what is called a jelly coat again this is what science tells us as they've looked inside and sees all of these things it's phenomenal we wouldn't know all of this is taking place without the scientists telling us this without science looking at these things and telling us this is why i say science proves intelligent design so the egg is surrounded by a jelly coat which is a gelatinous layer that surrounds the egg it's it just it's protecting it this jelly coat releases a specific chemical attractant which actually attracts the sperm to it so you've got the egg is released you've got the sperm is injected you have a special coat around the egg that puts out a chemical to attract the sperm to come to it now what's happening is many sperm encounter the egg and try to fertilize it by penetrating the egg when all, remember I said there's millions of sperm that are that are released and they're all coming there and when they get to this when they get to the egg they have to penetrate the egg in order to fertilize it so the sperm produces now enzymes this is fantastic. The sperm now produces enzymes, which allows it to bury, burrow through the outer jelly coat. So the jelly coat is there, putting out chemicals, attract the sperm. Now the sperm starts to come to the egg, and it starts to produce an enzyme, enzyme that's going to allow it to, to bur burrow itself through that protective coating so it can get inside and fertilize the egg. So the sperm plasma then fuses with the egg's membrane. The head, the sperm head then disconnects from the tail. You know, if you've ever seen pictures of sperm, it's like a little round head with a little tail back of it so it can swim and get to the egg. So when it gets there and it attaches itself to this, to the, to the outside there, the tail drops off and now the head is trying to, to burrow through, through the special enzymes in order to fertilize the egg once listen to this now if this isn't enough once one sperm penetrates the egg that's it done you're not going to get two you're not going to get three four five six seven one once one gets in there the egg says that's it that's enough one sperm gets through so once that one sperm gets through it changes the coating on the outside to prevent any other sperm from entering in I mean, how does that happen? How does it do that? The egg creates, I'm quoting here how science broke this down. Broke this down. The egg creates a protein shield that kills any other sperm trying to get in. So it's the early bird gets the worm. If you get up there and then boom, it gets through, then the egg goes, that's it, the rest of you are dead. Boom, a special shield comes around. It creates a coating that kills any other sperm trying to get in there. You're done. So the one gets through. So at this point, the egg is fertilized. Once the sperm, let me read this so I get it right. Once the sperm has introduced its genetic material into the egg, the new cell can now begin meiosis. Watch this process now. Meiosis occurs when the egg in the sperm splits its chromosomes. Humans normally have 46 chromosomes. The sperm in the egg each contribute 23. 23 and 23, 46 chromosomes to, to form a complete set. So now you have the fertilized egg. That is called a zygote. 
Again, you don't have to memorize all of this, but just follow the intricacy of the process. The fertilized egg is called a zygote. As the zygote travels down the fallopian tubes towards the uterus, the, the cells begin to divide. The zygote now becomes a blastocyst. These are the names science has given to it. So now it's changing. It's going down the tubes. It's, it's getting ready. It's moving to the uterus. The zygote now becomes a blastocyst, which contains the inner cells, which become the embryo and the outer cells, which will become the placenta. Next step you have after fertilization, you have implantation. At the end of the first week after fertilization, the blastocyst migrates to the uterus. It attaches itself to the endometrial lining at the uterus, which later becomes the placenta. The placenta now begins to form. When this starts to happen, the inside of the uterus starts to think, starts to thicken. The blastocyst attaches itself to the wall of the uterus. So now it's moved itself down as the cells are growing. It's attached itself to the walls of the uterus. Now it's going to start to grow. Once it's there, it's starting to develop into a baby. Next stage is the development. The zygote moves away from the lining as it matures. So it's attached, as if this is the uterus, right? It's attached itself uh, and it's getting what it needs there to start to grow. So as it starts to grow, it detaches itself because now it's going to get bigger. It's going to start forming itself into a human being. It can't stay attached to the wall like that. So it starts to break away from the wall of the uterus and as it develops as a baby. So it becomes unattached from the wall. Well, now if it's unattached, how is it going to get what it needs to grow? How is it going to breathe? How is it going to eat? How is it going to get nutrients? How is it going to get whatever it needs so that it doesn't die? Ladies, men, we should know, once I say it, there's an umbilical cord. Come on! It's breaking off from here, and now there's a cord that attaches it for the placenta that is there to the baby as the baby moves away so it has room to grow. It's attached to that wall, to the placenta, to the navel of the baby. It now has what, the umbilical cord. The umbilical cord, what does it do? It provides the baby with oxygen. It gives, helps the baby get sufficient nutrition. It, help, it helps to regulate the body temperature. It removes waste from the baby for processing by the mother's body. It filters out microbes that could cause infection. It transfers antibodies from the mother to the baby, helping to provide an immune system. And it produces hormones that keep the mother's body primed to support pregnancy. Are you kidding me? And all of that happened just by chance. Over billions and billions of years. It just happened. Are you kidding? If you cannot see intelligent design in this, you just don't want to see it. I mean, I can't climb inside your head, but, you know, we talked about this in the intro, that when we don't want to believe something, no amount of facts and no amount of evidence is going to change us. This is phenomenal. Absolutely. And I'm scratching the surface. There is so much more that goes on. How that baby forms. We're not even dealing with that. How it grows its own eyes and arms and limbs and its own organs. How in that seed... We've not even talked about this, but in the seed of the woman is everything that is needed to produce another human being. Everything that we've looked at, the circulatory system, the blood, the valves, the vessels, the, the heart, the kidneys, the, the everything, the brain, the eyes, the ears, the, everything. It's all contained in that seed so that it can grow. What kind of a mind did that? Are you kidding? The heavens declare the glory of God. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Those words make sense. It just happened. 
it just given enough time it gradually went from this to this to this to this of course if you don't have all those things at one time you're gonna die but we're not gonna talk about that it's just which takes more faith to believe that this just there's no organization to this there's no intelligent design it's all random it's all random does it take more faith to believe that or you know what there's somebody thinking and somebody making this happen let's move on to the last step you have birth hormones inside the mother begin a process called labor ladies you're well aware of that labor is recognized by the strong and painful muscle spasms when these muscle spasms start to come uh, they start frequently and maintain a regular pattern this is what is used to push the baby out through the vagina or the birth canal there you got it a brand new human being and again, I just, uh, I, I did it an injustice, but to me, that's more than enough to say, are you kidding me? This is absolutely mind-boggling. Mind-boggling. And you know, I, I wanted to look at this and say, what do the evolutionists say about this? I, aside from, you know, things just happen over billions of years. They just, they just, if it can't happen a million, then they make it billions. It's unbelievable. They talk billions like it's nothing. It's just, you know, well, not one billion. Well, it's four billion or ten. You know, who cares? It's amazing. I went and looked. And there's numerous things that I read. This is the three. Let me give you three. This is the three best summaries that I found. Maybe you can find something better. But that I found of how they answer reproduction. Let me quote. Number one. <clears throat> Sexual reproduction with separate genders, male and female, evolved at least 1.2 billion years ago. Every time I hear that, I go, excuse me, and how do you know that? How do you know that? One, not 1 billion, not 1.2 billion. They're making it up. But l l let me not digress. Sexual reproduction with s separate genders <clears throat> evolved at least 1.2 billion years ago. The mechanism by which separates genders apparent is a maddingly... Let me read this again. <clears throat> the mechanism by which s separates genders... I'm really goofing this sentence up. The, sep the mechanism by which separate genders appear is maddingly unclear. So how do you get male and female? What made that happen? That's what they're saying. The mechanisms by which separate genders appeared is maddingly unclear. How's that for an answer? Number two. The way sexually reproducing species developed up to today without dying out due to critical parts missing is very simple. Really? Listen to their simple answer. I'm quoting here. Everything with a mutation that resulted in a critical part missing died. Everything alive today got lucky. End of quote. How's that? If it had a critical part missing, it died. If it didn't have a critical part missing, it got lucky and it lived. We don't know how it happened and we don't know when it happened, but died or got lucky. One more. One more. But what we know today as sexually reproduction wasn't always the way it was. Okay. Obviously, sexual reproduction didn't just occur out of nowhere like everything else. <laughs> it has evolved and changed over time. Easy to say. The exact mechanism for how sexual reproduction came about are still not fully understood because this is not something that is easily tested in experiments. End of quote. So what are they saying? How did all this come about? We know it just came about gradually. And we know it was one step at a time. And we know it was over billions of years. But how did it happen? We don't know. We just don't know. We haven't got a clue. It's not fully understood. You're not even partially understanding it. It's not fully understood because it's not something that is easily tested in experiments. <clears throat> then why do you say it happened? If you can't test it, then why did you say it happened? Do you see the prejudice 
Do you see the bias? You can't test it, which is one of the rules of science. You have to be able to see it, you have to test it, you have to repeat the test, you have to verify, you have to substantiate everything. They're saying, well, we can't tell you how it happened because we can't test it, but we're telling you it happened. Really? How can you tell me it happened if you don't know how it happened or why it happened? You're starting out with the premise of this is how it happened. Why? Because you don't want to believe in intelligent design. Why? Because you don't want to believe in God. We're going to get into that later. We're going to break that down. <clears throat> Absolutely phenomenal. So you look at all of this and honestly ask yourself, which is more reasonable? Random chance that we can't explain with no design whatsoever, just happens to all work together like that? or intelligent design with an intelligent designer that made it happen. You tell me which is more reasonable. Remove the biases, remove the prejudices, logically think this one through. I'm gonna to stick to my grounds until I can figure it out. Your choice. Or you know what? This is why God says in scriptures, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. You gotta be foolish to think that this stuff just all happened. But we're gonna continue on. We're gonna continue on in our next lesson. We're gonna continue to look on the amazing things that are inside the human body. Thank you for watching. Lord bless you.